So uh, tonight we are going to be discussing this piece of artwork that you see in front of you right now, this graphic, this logo, this self-proclaimed great seal of the state of New Jersey. And if you've lived in New Jersey for any length of time, you have probably encountered this. It's on state buildings, it's on the state flag, it's on forums and paperwork and so forth from the state. But you probably haven't given a whole lot of thought about what it really represents, how it came to be, aside from just being a logo for New Jersey. But who are these two women? Why is there a horse's head on it? These are the questions that we're going to be exploring this evening. Now, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the history of the concept of the seal to give you uh, context for, for this particular this specific seal. Uh, we're going to start off with a very basic question. What do we mean when we say a seal? Well, we don't mean the uh, marine mammal, unfortunately. We don't mean this pleasant fellow, but we do mean what the uh, dictionary describes as something that confirms, ratifies, or makes secure. Uh, it can also be considered a symbol or a mark of office. So for as long as there has been human civilization, as long as there has been business, as long as there has been government, there has been paperwork. There's been all kinds of certificates and documents and licenses and proclamations and so on, invoices that need to be marked in some way to let someone know that this is an official document, that this is authentic, that it carries the weight of authority of the issuing institution. So this is actually a very old concept. Now, it goes back to the very earliest days of civilization. They didn't have paperwork per se, they had clay tablet work. Uh, this is before even the invention of paper. So we can go all the way back to Mesopotamia. This is an example of what is called a cylinder seal that uh, was used by a queen in 2600 BC. And as you can see, it is actually a cylinder and they carved uh, these figures into it and they would roll this across the still wet clay in order to create the bas relief image that you see on the right. And this was the mark of the queen or her representative to indicate that this clay tablet, the information was official. Now, the advent of paper is generally uh, credited, traditionally credited to Kai Lun. I think I pronounced that correctly. Chinese eunuch from the court, uh, Chinese eunuch court official from the Eastern Han Dynasty. Um, paper existed in various forms before him. But uh, he was the one who kind of perfected what we would consider to be the modern paper making process. So it's no surprise that when it came to the concept of the seal, the uh, Asian cultures used stamps, like what we would think of as rubber stamps, except these are made out of wood, they're made out of ivory and so forth to transfer ink onto the paper document. Uh, this is a particularly fancy example. This is from Korea late 16th to early 17th centuries this is the this is the royal seal it's made out of brass and as you can see the handle is made to look like a tortoise and it would put in the ink put onto the paper and it would make this pattern and it achieves this by this intricate uh engraving on the bottom of the brass base which is an early form of korean writing now, when we think of seals in the West, uh, seal can, it, it's, it's an object, but it can also be considered to be a verb, to seal a letter, to seal an envelope. Now, prior to 1840, you did not have envelopes. You would take your letter, you would fold it as uh, is seen here, or something called letter locking. You would fold it together in such a way that you could tuck one of the, the, one of the edges into the other edges, so that it would be difficult to open up. Now, in order to protect it from prying eyes, you would seal it, which meant putting a dollop of wax, sealing wax onto the edge and imprinting it in such a way that uh, you had your logo on it. Um, so this is, we're gonna use an envelope in this example, but you would put your wax onto it and then you would stamp it with something called a signet uh, which would imprint a logo or some kind of graphic onto it. This would make this an official correspondence. Uh, it would serve two purposes. One was, again, to mark it as official, but also to protect it against tampering because in order to open it, you would have to break the seal. So it was a way of not only making your correspondence official, but protecting it against prying eyes. 
Now the concept of the signet, uh, it could be a hand stamp. It could also be a ring. This is an example from Egypt, uh, from the Pharaoh Tutankhamun. Uh, this, the hieroglyphs here mean perfect God, Lord of the two lands. This is a later example from the Byzantine Empire used for sealing personal documents and validating wills and testaments. So it's the same concept, the signet, uh, a way of stamping, uh, imprinting a image or words or something that makes it official into whether it's the wax or using it as a stamp for ink. Um, the concept is the same, mechanisms change. And you can see that we're going from ancient Egypt to the Byzantine Empire, and yet the concept is the same. Rings have the advantage that the official or the, lead, or the, the pharaoh or whoever, whomever it is wears this as part of the accoutrements of office. And so the chances of it falling into the wrong hands are a little bit less. Uh, there were obviously laws against forging these things, but uh, this was a way of securing the actual physical seal itself. In addition to sealing a envelope or a letter, you could also just put the wax onto the document itself and make the imprint on it to, again, to impart your seal onto it. There was also something known as a double-sided seal. So what you would do in this case is put the wax between these two molds, push them together, and it would create a double-sided seal, like a wax coin with images on both sides. Now, the question, of course, is, well, how do you get this attached to a document? That is the pendant seal. So it's the same idea, except you would put a string or a thread or a ribbon inside of the wax when you would put it between these two uh, molds. Then you would tie that to the document. In this example, you can see the string is tied to the bottom. It's actually been folded over to hide some of the, the extra strands and to make it extra strong so that it, you know, it wouldn't fall off. This is probably my favorite example of a pendant seal. This is a 1530 letter sent by English noblemen to urge Pope Clement to annul Henry VIII's marriage so that he could marry Anne Boleyn. And think about this. You have these noblemen. Uh, they are writing a letter to a pope on behalf of a king. This is an official situation. You, you, they want to make sure that the pope knows that this has their, the, 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 these are authentic signatures, and this has their seal. These are the seals that are hanging off the bottom of this thing. There are 85 of them. I counted them. Um, I think the, what's happening with the ones where there's the white is they were probably not double-sided seals. So they would uh, put it onto a piece of paper and then just add the paper to these, these strings of, of seals. You can imagine trying to deliver this with all these seals hanging off of it. The concept of the seal, of course, is still with us. Uh, today, we have embossed seals, which embosses the image into the paper. These are used for certificates, licenses, notary publics. And there are, here's an example of notary public stamps that you can get. And if you look at the bottom two there, they have the great seal of the state of New Jersey. Now, the concept of a stamp as a seal would have been very familiar to uh, the colonists of North America, the British colonists uh, in the lead up to the American Revolution. Now, when we hear the word stamp, we tend to think of the little adhesive piece of paper you put on your letter to show that you paid the postage. Uh, but this is what they would have thought of. This is an example of a stamp, a stamped seal from the 1764 Stamp Act. This was a tax that was the British Parliament placed on paper that was imported into the colonies of North America. In order to prove that you paid the tax, you would have to get this stamp, this embossed stamp that has the coat of arms on it. This is, of course, one of the taxes that would ultimately lead to the American Revolution. So by the time of the American Revolution, uh, the concept of the seal as an important part of legitimacy of setting up a government, of setting up an institution had been very well established. It was an ancient concept even by then. But I think it's striking when you stop to think that here are these guys, they have to put together a new country. They have to create a new government. They are creating a constitution. They're creating a legislature. They're creating a judiciary, all the different departments, finding people to fill these roles. They're doing this against the backdrop of a shooting war, a rebellion against what was the strongest 
power, world power on the face of the earth at the time, Great Britain. And yet, one of the first things that they thought of in terms of setting up a government was essentially, we need a logo, we need a great seal, we need something under which we can issue our paperwork that will make it official. So there were three different committees that were set up between 1776 and 1782 that were tasked with creating a great seal of the United States. And here are examples of um, some of the designs from these three different uh, uh, committees along with the artists who drew them. They were, they were a group of people, they would uh, pull their ideas together, hand it off to an artist to sketch, to try to come up with a cohesive design. So in 1776, you have Pierre Eugene du Cimetière. Uh, in 1780, you have Francis Hopkinson. And both of these gentlemen, we're gonna talk uh, about a little more in depth momentarily because they are both involved with New Jersey. Now you have the 1782 seal down there by William Barton. Um, incredibly complicated piece of work, a lot of symbolism, a lot of stuff going on there. And that's part of the reason why it was rejected because it was just too complicated. The final design was drawn by this gentleman, Charles Thompson, and you can see what he came up with on the right here. And you start to see some of the elements that we would recognize today as the modern great seal of the United States of America. The themes are all there and it would eventually be refined into what we now know. Now this same process was being played out throughout the colonies as the colonies were becoming states they were making their own declaration of independence. They had to create their own constitution, set up their own local state governments. And this was certainly happening in New Jersey. They met at Nassau Hall in Princeton on uh, July the 2nd, 1776, they signed their state constitution. And in the preamble of this constitution was New Jersey's declaration of independence against the crown, against King, uh, King George III. And so not only did you have the uh, Continental Congress declaring independence, but each of the individual colonies as they were coming online as states also declared their independence. Needless to say, this did not make King George terribly happy. As far as he was concerned, they were all a bunch of traitors and that carried the penalty of death. So not only were these people uh, trying to set up a government and doing all this stuff against the backdrop of war, but their lives were literally on the line. They would be hung if they were captured. Nevertheless, establishing a seal was so integral to creating a government, a legitimate government, that it was part of this initial constitution. So Article 11 says that the council and assembly shall have the power to make the great seal of this colony. Interesting, they refer to themselves as colony, not state yet. It's a transitionary period which shall be kept by the governor or in his absence by the vice president of the council to be used by them as occasion may require, and it shall be called the great seal of the colony of New Jersey. So in addition to being a, uh, a design, a logo, a graphic, it was also a physical thing that it was the signet essentially that would be used to uh, mark official documents. So somebody had to keep it, in this case, it would be the governor or the um, vice president of the council. So on September 6, 1776, Richard Smith of Burlington County, John Cooper of Gloucester County, they were assigned to create a committee to come up with a design for a great seal to get this made. They uh, brought on board Samuel Dick of, Sa of Salem County, Ephraim Harris of Cumberland County, John Covenhoe of Monmouth County, Charles Cox Hunterton County, and again, they were tasked with the idea of coming up with a design. Now, um, you know, it's designed by committee and I'm a graphic designer and I know how hard that can be and how time consuming that can be. And so John Fell, uh, he was the representative from Bergen County and um, he realized that it was gonna take time to, to, to come up with this design. And in the meantime, the government itself was going to have to still function and still be able to issue documents under some form of seal. And so he proffered a resolution having taken into consideration that it will be necessary, that it will necessarily take up some time to get a proper great seal and that it will be necessary for the public good that sundry commissions should issue before such great seal can be made. 
be it resolved that the seal of his arm, that the seal of arms of his Excell excellency William Livingston Esquire shall be deemed and taken as the great seal of the state till another shall be made. They're referring, of course, to William Livingston. He was the first governor of the state of New Jersey, 1776 to 1790. Now, this, I believe, is his coat of arms. And I, I hedge that a little bit just because in researching this, the Livingston family, different lines of the family had different designs. But this one, this is the one that appears to be associated specifically with him. Uh, so essentially, this was the great seal of the state of New Jersey temporarily until the official one could be created. So the committee, they came up with their ideas and what this thing should look like, but they needed somebody who could draw it up, who could, a graphic artist essentially, who could bring it all together into a cohesive design. And so they hired this gentleman, Francis Hopkinson. Now, he's an interesting character. Um, give you a little bit of a history about him. He was born in Philadelphia in 1737. I found this part particularly interesting. He was the first native-born American composer of a secular song when in 1759 he published something called My Days Have Been So Wondrous Free. This has absolutely nothing to do with the Great Seal of New Jersey, but I was really curious what does this sound like? This is only a minute and a half long. Uh, a little musical inter interlude for everybody. This is sung by Thomas Hampson, uh, piano Wolf, Wolfram Riger. Make sure I give everybody credit here. So it was a poem by a Thomas Parnell that Francis Hopkinson adapted into this song. So hopefully this is going to work. It's not okay. It's not important to the main story here. So let's let's just continue. Uh, so in addition to being a musician, Francis Hopkinson was also involved in local politics. Um, he worked with a commission that made treaties with various Indian tribes in 1761 on behalf of Pennsylvania. He was a lawyer. He was in private practice between 1761 and 1766. And he seems to have had a real interest in becoming the collector of customs uh, in, in the local governments. He was a collector of customs in Salem, New Jersey in 1763. Between May of 1766, August of 1767, he leaves the colonies, goes to England because he wants to try to become the commissioner of customs for all of North America. Uh, he was not, he did not receive this job. It would have been a plum one, but he did not receive it. Returns to Philadelphia in 1768, becomes a merchant. He's seen selling, found to be selling fabrics, port wine, and whatever else he can find. Uh, he's a collector of customs for Newcastle, Delaware. Finally, he moves to Bordentown, New Jersey in 1773. And there's a story about how during the American Revolution, when the Hessians uh, invaded Bordentown and, and were occupying Bordentown and were burning houses to the ground, the Hessian general uh, did not burn down Francis Hopkinson's because he admired the library that he had in his house. So the moral of the story is collect books. Um, he was a delegate. Okay, so once he was in New Jersey, he was a member of the Provincial Council, finally a delegate to the Se Second Continental Congress. And this is where he becomes one of the five men to sign the Declaration of Independence on behalf of New Jersey. In addition to his musical talents, uh, he is also a graphic artist or a, a, an artist, a, draw, a draw, uh, sketch artist. And as I mentioned, he creates the, this drawing of the second seal, the second committee for the U.S. Great Seal. He is probably best known for having designed the U.S. flag. Uh, it's very similar to a U.S. Navy flag. He evidently had a thing for red stripes, but... Um, his design is, he, that's probably what he's best known for in terms of his design work. But he also designed the logo for the US Department of Treasury, as well as some continental currency notes. And this is an example from 1778 for $50.
So the creating the design was one thing, getting the physical signet made was another. He was not an engraver. He did not have those skills. Uh, unfortunately, none of his sketches appear to have survived, but he was uh, employed to, to engage engaged to employ proper persons at Philadelphia to prepare a silver seal, which is to be round of two and a half inches diameter, three eighths of an inch thick. This is the physical signet that is going to be uh, used to seal documents. And he was given specific instructions uh, that the arm shall be three plows in an escutcheon that's being a shield and the supporters, the figures on either side, Liberty and Cirrus, and at the crest, a horse's head. These words to be engraved in large letters around the arms, the great seal of New Jersey. So he had to find somebody who could take all the stuff, take his sketches and turn it into the physical engraved silver seal. Uh, he hires Pierre Eugene du Cimetier, uh, who we encountered before, another fascinating guy. He was born in the Republic of Geneva, which is now part of Switzerland. He spent more than a decade in the West Indies before finally landing in New York and then Philadelphia. In 1779, he's credited with creating the first known portrait of George Washington, uh, a sketch that was reproduced in a number of uh, variations by engravers. They, they turned it into reproducible artwork. This is an example of his work. Uh, he made his living as an artist. Uh, he was given an honorary master's of art degree from the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton in 1781. He gave drawing lessons to Thomas Jefferson's daughter, Martha. But he was a bit of a polymath. He liked geography, geology, mineralogy, archaeology, numismatics, and he had a penchant for American history. What history there was at this point uh, early on in the country's uh, existence, of course, but he was fascinated by it. He collected all sorts of material having to do with the American Revolution, both the intellectual underpinnings as well as the, the war itself, as well as the natural uh, and man-made products of the, this new American uh, country. In 1782, he assembles a bunch of this stuff as well as other curiosities in the American Museum on Arch Street, uh, House on Arch Street in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And this is considered to have been one of the first or the first museum in North America, certainly the first history museum. And as you can see from this flyer advertising it, he divides it up between natural curiosities and artificial curiosities, meaning objects found in nature, but also object, man-made objects. And it's just this eclectic mixture of all kinds of cool stuff that people will pay to come and see. He was also a member of the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, founded by Benjamin Franklin, and is, was the, the designer of their logo that you see here. As I mentioned before, he was uh, he sketched out one of the earliest examples of the uh, U.S. Great Seal from that first committee. Obviously, it was not adopted, but there are elements from it that were adopted in the final design. He is credited with coining the motto e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And if you look at this uh, sketch on the right here, if you look above the shield between the two figures, there is what appears to be an eye in a triangle with rays coming out of it. This is the eye of provenance. And what some people don't know is that the great seal of the United States is actually a double-sided seal. And this is what the back of it looks like. And you can see it incorporates that eye of provenance concept. There's also other uh, models on the back that you, you may not be aware of, but you may recognize this because this is what is on the back of the $1 bill. So the great seal, both sides of it are on the back of the dollar bill. In 1777, he also designs the state seals for Delaware as well as Georgia. So here is uh, a early sketch of his of the of the uh, coat of arms for New Jersey, and you can see he's incorporating most of the the elements from his instructions. There's some other stuff involved here as well. By May of 1777, New Jersey has its official seal, its official signet, um, and De Cimetier, he he diverges a little bit from his instructions. 
uh, he adds this thing. This is actually a it's supposed to be a knight's helmet seen face on. That was not in his original instructions. He also adds 1776 in Roman numerals. And again, not part of his original uh, instructions, but he took a certain amount of artistic liberty and added these things to it. And indeed, the concept of artistic liberty is a feature of uh, the, the history of this, this seal. And these are examples of it on into the early 20, 20th century. And you can see all the different variations. Some include the, uh, the, the, uh, the knight's helmet, some do not. Uh, the, fra the, the motto, liberty and prosperity, it was unofficially adopted later on. Sometimes it appears, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's above it, sometimes below it, sometimes, you know, the different variations on the shield. So it was kind of all over the place, but the basic elements were always there. As the official symbol of the state of New Jersey, it was, of course, put on the money. Back then, states issued their own currency. This is a one shilling and six pence note that was issued in 1881. And you can see the shield, the, the uh, coat of arms is on there. But what's interesting is it appears to have been flopped horizontally, because if you look at the actual seal, you can see that everybody's facing in, in an opposite direction. Elements of it were picked up for the first New Jersey coin, 1787 copper, you, the horse's head and the plow, Nova Cesara, which is Latin for New Jersey. The there were variations on this uh, that were used uh, for a very long time, and it might surprise people to know that the this all this was not codified in any kind of meaningful way until 1928, and this is when the state legislature finally incorporates the cemetery's additions. They include the motto and change the uh, the Roman numerals into modern Arabic for the 1776. So now we're going to talk about the symbolism. What is all this stuff? Why is it here? And there's two traditions that are uh, mined in order to create this graphic. One is European heraldry, and the other is ancient Greek and particularly Roman mythology and history. Now, back then in the uh, uh, late 18th century, if you were educated, part of your education was Greek and Roman mythology and history. That was part of what constituted a well-rounded, good education. And so for a lot of people, this was part of the, the zeitgeist. This was part of the culture. And they would have recognized a lot of the symbolism here in a way that I think has probably been lost on us today, since this really isn't part of our education uh, as it was, to the same degree as it was back then. So we're going to start off with the shield. Now, this is obviously uh, this goes into European heraldry. Uh, it's a it's the three plows on the shield representing New Jersey's agricultural tradition. There's a reason we're called the Garden State, and this is evocative of that. Now, the very concept of a shield representing an individual or a family or an institution, or in this case, a state goes back into the, the uh, Middle Ages, goes back into the era of knights, where um, it serves something of a practical purpose. Uh, if you were in armor, if you were in battle, it'd be hard to tell who was who. And so you have this large surface of the shield that they would carry. And if you put a design onto it, uh, you would help to differentiate you from the guy standing next to you. And so this is an example from 1151, an illustration that is considered to be one of the earliest depictions because you can see on his shield there, is, there are these lions. This is uh, a, a, a roll, what's called a roll from Germany. It's um, basically a catalog of the different shields uh, that were able to be identified. You can see the wide range of the colors and the patterns and the motifs and so on, the iconography that's going on there. So on either side of the shield, you have these two female figures. And this is where we start getting more into the, the Roman mythology. On the right is Liberty. Liberty here is an allegorical female figure. The female personification of Liberty traces itself to the ancient Roman goddess Libertas. Libertas gained popularity at the founding of the Roman Republic. There were many uh, temples that were erected to her. And here is a coin with her imagery on it, including the word libertas on the left. Now, 
the concept of a female personification of liberty is something that's still with us, on, uh, particularly on our coins. This is probably one of the most famous examples. This is St. Gordon's 1907 U.S. Double Eagle with the Walking Liberty. It's here to be one of the finest examples of, um, of this type of design on U.S. coins. Now, during this whole period, of course, you also had the French Revolution going on, and the French definitely adopted the female personification of liberty in the iconography of what, what was going on at the time. The image in the middle, liberty leading the people, is probably one of the most famous uh, examples of that. Uh, we, of course, in the U.S. will know uh, liberty enlightening the world, which was the, a gift from France in 1886 also known as the Statue of Liberty or Lady Liberty. I wanna focus on the image that I have on the left here, La Liberté by Valaine, 1794. More importantly, what she is holding, because it is the same concept of what Liberty is holding on the New Jersey State Seal. This is a Liberty cap. This traces uh, its history back to the Greek Phrygian and the Roman Pilius hat. These were a conical felt hat that was associated with emancipated slaves in Eastern Europe and Anatolia. Um, when a slave was freed, they were given this, this hat as a symbol of their freedom. And so uh, this iconography this became uh, equated with the very concept of freedom and emancipation and so on. By the time of the American Revolution, it was definitely ingrained. And again, because of the education, the, 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 the education in uh, ancient Roman history and so forth, uh, this icon was still very potent. This is a, a, a political cartoon of John Wilkes. He was an English uh, journalist and politician who uh, supported the cause, which was uh, made him a pariah among some in, in London. But you can see him here drawn with a liberty cap on the end of a, a stick, the end of a staff. And in various protests and processions, they would put one of these caps on the end of a pole and hold it aloft for people to see as a symbol of freedom. The idea of the liberty cap today is not terribly well known or well, it's not part of the culture necessarily right now. Uh, but it was certainly into the early 20th century. This is an example of artwork that was created for a World War I uh, recruitment poster, Be Patriotic by Paul Starr. And you see there's a female uh, personification of America, of freedom, of liberty, and she's wearing a liberty cap. Uh, I found this today. Uh, I, I added this only a couple hours ago. Um, evidently, the the uh, mascot for the 2024 Paris Olympics is supposed to be a Liberty cap. So evidently this, this still retains at least some currency, uh, at least in France, although I've seen a lot of criticisms of it, but um, that this is, this is a callback to that concept of the Liberty cap. So the figure on the right, according to the instructions is Cirrus, the Roman goddess of agriculture, fertility, and motherhood. But she also has a lot in common with Abodontia, the Roman goddess of plenty or riches as in prosperity. When you marry this with the motto of liberty and prosperity, uh, that connection becomes a little bit stronger. So this is a painting uh, of abundance by Peter Paul Rubens in 1630. And I'm showing this to you because I want you to pay attention again to what she's holding. It mimics what is being held by uh, prosperity in the, in the New Jersey seal. It is of course a cornucopia. Now we are entering the Thanksgiving uh, holiday season where the cornucopia or the horn of plenty is uh, an emblem. Uh, most people probably don't know where this thing came from. This is one of those things that reaches back into Roman mythology. Now there are two variations, two stories as to the origins of this concept. Um, I'm gonna give you the down and dirty version because it gets very complicated, but evidently, the god Zeus, when he was a baby, uh, there was a danger that he was going to be eaten by his father Cronus. So they hid him away on the island of Crete where he would be protected by divine attendants, including a goat by the name of Amalthea who suckled him. Playing with her and not necessarily realizing his godlike strength, he accidentally breaks off one of her horns. Um, 
far from being uh, offended by this, Amalthea turns this horn, her horn into a magical never-ending container of milk. So you can imagine a horn uh, as a cup, and uh, it's, no matter how much milk the baby drinks, there's always going to be more. So it becomes associated with the concept of abundance and plenty, the horn of plenty. There's another version that involves Hercules. Hercules is wrestling with the river god for the right to marry a princess. The river god has, is a shapeshifter. He can change himself into various forms, and he decides he's going to take the shape of a bull in order to better combat Hercules. However, Hercules prevails, and in the combat, uh, he breaks off one of the horns, which the sea nymphs fill with flowers, and you can kind of see the theme that's going on here. There's another variation on that where, where the river god retreats. Uh, he leaves behind a horn-shaped plot of land, which is rich and, and um, uh, fertile because of the river silt that is left behind. So again, these links to the concept of uh, abundance and, and so forth. The, so this example, this is uh, an illustration that's found on a Greek uh, mixing bowl. Now the Greeks knew Hercules as Heracles, but you can see down here there is the broken off horn. And this of course ends up becoming the horn of plenty. Now uh, another wrinkle in this story is that in many cultures there are horn-shaped baskets that farmers would use, would carry, they could sling them uh, around their body to keep their hands free while they're harvesting crops. And so the idea of a basket, a horn-shaped basket being full of fresh produce, abundance, uh, that's part of, that comes into play into the symbolism as well. And also why uh, many of the, the cornucopias you see are, are also made of wicker or baskets. And this ends up being on the great seal of the state of New Jersey. Now we're gonna look at the helmet. So if you know how to read the helmet, you can get an idea as to who it represents. And th this brings us back into European heraldry again. So uh, if you were an esquire, a gentleman, the helmet that you would have on your coat of arms would be made out of steel, the visor would be closed, and it would be shown in profile. If you were a knight, it would again be a steel helmet, but it'd be face on with the visor open. If you were a peer of the realm, it would be a steel helmet with gold decoration. In profile, the visor would be closed in a sort of grill uh, type of a uh, closure. And if you were a king, a sovereign, you would have a gold helmet with the closed grill uh, visor face on. Now, if you remember, this was one of those things that the cimetière uh, added on his own, took some artistic license with. And this is a type of helmet that you see on the Great Seal. And at first, that might seem like an odd choice because certainly the American Revolution was about throwing off kings and, and, and sovereigns and all that sort of thing. Um, and yet, when you stop to think about it, it actually makes sense in this context, because this is not the coat of arms of an individual or of a family. It is the coat of arms of a group of people, citizens of the state of New Jersey. And in the democratic concept, ostensibly, the people are sovereign. So from that perspective, this actually does make sense. Above the helmet is the crest. This is symbolic of decorative sculpture that was worn by knights on their helmets during tournaments. I found this picture. Uh, evidently, there is a joust that uh, takes place in Tuscany, in Italy, that still goes on today, and uh, people dress up in the period costumes. And you can see this knight with this giant bird on top of his head. This is an example of a crest in, in, in armor. Uh, if we look back at that German roll again, you can see that there are crests uh, being depicted above. So you have the, the, the shields, you have the helmet, and then you have examples of the crests. And there's a couple different designs here. There, there's wings, there's horns, and it, the, the, I thought this was kind of interesting. The one at the, on the top row in the middle, the yellow one, looks for all the world like a puppy. Um, that was this person's crest, apparently. Uh, Eventually, as you know, we get away from it actually being a part of uh, 
physical armor and it's more symbolic and part of heraldry, uh, it becomes more just a graphic element. And this is, these are examples from a book from England in 1817. You can see the wide variety of iconography and forms that the crest takes. So why a horse? Why, well, the horse is representative of uh, agriculture. It's used in agriculture, representative of strength. It's also representative of horse racing, which is all part of the history and heritage of the Garden State. And so what you may not know is that uh, its place as a state animal only dates to 1977. So fifth grader, Michael McCarthy, he was the son of uh, Senate Assistant Secretary John J. McCarthy. He petitioned with his class to make the horse the official state uh, animal. And then Governor Brendan T. Byrne, he signed it into law August 14th, 1977 at a farm and horse show in Sussex County. Between the helmet and the crest is something called a torse. This is a twisted roll of fabric laid about the top of the helmet. There's no real symbolism to this aside from it being a graphic element that ties the helmet and the crest together to create a nice clean uh, connection. However, these were physical objects that were used by knights. Again, we're gonna go back to this guy's picture and you can see there is a torse uh, around uh, his helmet beneath the crest. The filigree work on either side, this is known as mantling. It's a, it's a symbolic representation of a cloth that knights oftentimes would drape around their helmets in order to protect it from the elements and also from sword blows. And frequently it's shown in shreds as if fresh from battle. Um, in this case, it's very much just an artistic uh, graphic element, uh, but you, you, this, it's based on this concept, this, this, this tradition of the mantling. And again, going back to this picture, you can see that, that this person does have the cloth draped uh, off the back of their helmet. And again, we can go back to that German role and you can see that they have uh, that represented here as well. So this was a, a physical thing as well as symbolic. So the motto, liberty and prosperity, um, it was kind of the unofficial motto. It, it was not incorporated officially until 1928. Mottos, their origins are from the idea of battle cries or rallying cries, but they evolved into uh, brief statements of purpose or of values or something representing yourself, your family, or in this case, a state or an institution. And of course, it was adapted into the state flag. Uh, it was adopted May 11th, 1896 as the New Jersey state flag. The current version that uh, you see today outside of uh, state government buildings was uh, created in 1965. So a lot of this stuff is fairly recent. Uh, that may be surprising to some people who think that this is a, a very old symbol. It is, but the current versions of it, the, the updated versions of it are fairly recent. And with that, um, that's about it. This is, this is the seal. And I hope that uh, after learning a little bit about it and some of its history and some of its, uh, the, the stories behind it, the symbolism behind it, that you will have a greater appreciation of it. And I don't know about you, but I think it's pretty great. So thank you very much.